questions and you want answers. Welcome to the Q&A show. Thank you very much. Believe it or not, we are live and this is the first time I've been live, uh, well, I have lived for a good few <laughs> years, but it's the first time I've been live on television for a couple of months and I just want to thank you for joining us this evening on Revelation TV's Q&A show. A uh, little bit different tonight because we're still changing the sets around. Let me explain very, very quickly because we do have a few sceptical people out there. We're not creating new sets with it costs money. Uh, it's just that we're changing the sets to accommodate uh, and make it possible for us to have a variety uh, of more programming uh, and therefore it, it just means we're changing uh, the way in which the sets are situated and the sort of backgrounds that we're going to be using. So we're not, it's no real costs involved. Uh, so that's for those who are sending emails and questioning why we were doing such things. I wonder if you do the same for the BBC. Never mind. Anyway, I'd like to introduce you to tonight's guest, John Mackay, who's been uh, with us uh, perhaps three years ago, the last time we saw you, John. Three years live. I've been Skype in between then, but it's good to see you again, mate. Better than Skyping. But, John, you've been on a two-month tour across the British Isles. That's correct. Yeah. Now, just for those who perhaps have just switched in tonight, we do have new viewers all the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. uh, Director of Creation Research. That's correct. Uh, from Australia all the way to Spain, just for this new set here, <laughs> which they rearranged this afternoon while we were here filming. So I know it didn't cost them hardly anything. So anyway, listen, yes, we've been two months in the UK uh, talking to students running school stuff, government high school stuff, uh, doing some research, digging up fossil squids and trees together. And as you know, Howard, the squids always swim amongst the trees. So we've been doing <laughs> yes, of course. research on flood deposits and uh, of course a few radio and TV type uh, programs and uh, releasing our newest DVD called Time's Up Darwin. Mm. Now, John, just give a, a little overview of, of the sort of uh, subjects and topics that we should be covering tonight and so that people can stay on topic rather okay. than asking a, a much broader uh, Things range that of I questions. know nothing about. Yes, yes uh, or myself <laughs> even. Yeah. Okay, uh, my background, trained in geology, used to lecture in, in geology, taught science before that, taught little kids before that, became a Christian from a non-Christian background and then uh, used to run a music group actually like you were involved in but uh, when people found out I was sort of Mr. Science as well as a Christian, they started saying, well, what about the dinosaurs and what about Noah's flood and what about the millions of years? And so gradually I found myself forced into having to get a vast repertoire of information about Genesis, particularly Genesis 1 to 11 on creation, Noah's flood and the Tower of Babel. Now, there seems to be just a few of us in the world that actually uh, think that Genesis or the accounts in Genesis is such an important foundational teaching uh, to the Christian faith. Why would you say that is? Well, coming from a non-Christian background, uh, I, I think back across my own history and I remember our uh, science teacher who we call Fatty Phillips. He was sort of just as wide as he was tall, uh, but a really good teacher and uh, he impressed the theory of evolution on us. And it occurred to me, even at high school, that if we just evolved from animals, then we were free to do what we liked. And in reality, whether you then want to throw God into the picture or leave God totally out, the God you throw in is a God you can control. It's not the God of the Bible who demands absolute power because he absolutely created the heavens and the earth. So it's a question of convenience of either theology or politics. People don't want to be reminded that if God made the universe in just six days, he can rip the rugs out from underneath you, whether you're a bishop or a, or, or a coal miner, you know, in, in less than six seconds. So that's, that's what the real issue is. Whose authority do you accept? Hmm. Talking of bishops, it seems to me that as well that there's very little um, agreement between the hierarchy in the traditional churches and say the evangelical churches which do believe more in what the Bible says than you know, as I say your traditional uh, well, clerics. Well there's nothing new under the sun the, uh, the writer of the Proverbs wrote you know three and a half thousand years ago or so and what you'll find is when Jesus was on this earth his critics were what would be the equivalent of bishops you know the academic elite the academic theologians of the day who would have argued over the smallest trifle of theology and let the poor go hungry at the same time. And so you'll find that, yes, the average person who, like me, 
comes from outside the church and actually really does meet Jesus who changes him, right? Then you have a brand new appreciation of just how great this person is compared to someone who sort of learned a lot of theology and involved in politics of the church. There's no doubt about it that the average Bible-believing layman probably has a much greater confidence in the biblical record than the academic theologian does. Mm. So to strain out the net, the net, as it were, and swallow the camel is a little bit what uh, can really be uh, seen today in the traditional church or, or the hierarchy of that. Uh, what would Jesus have done in his time that would have been similar to, say, your ministry and others like you? Okay, well, the, the classic example, and it's one that, that I've been using for years because one of the side things that I got involved in and I never expected to do was sort of marriage counselling. And uh, then I began to think, okay, here's some of my friends, their marriage is in a serious trouble. How do I help them? And as I'm reading through Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is confronted by the religious leaders and they're asking him about divorce. And he immediately begins to reply to them, yes. not with an academic response, but by saying, haven't you guys read Genesis? In the beginning, God made them male and female. There's the first statement. Therefore, a man will take a wife. His third statement, what God has put together, don't you dare put asunder. And so therefore, his whole rationale was, you ask me about the end of marriage, I'm going to take you back to the beginning. So this is the sort of way Jesus approached his teaching, his doctrine. Likewise, when the apostles asked him about, you know, what's it going to be like when the world ends? And he says, just like it was in Noah's day. All right, and you think back to Noah. Uh, men will be marrying women. Men will be marrying whatever. You know, they'll be doing what they like. They'll be ignoring God. Everyone will do what's right in their own eyes, which is a description of Western democracy today. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to believe anything. You just have to be popular. You just have to do what people want. And so Jesus actually answered their question about end times by taking them back to a previous judgment of God upon the whole of mankind. Mm. Now, that scripture you quoted is, to me, is a, a vitally important one in pointing people to what would Jesus have thought about uh, creation versus evolution, for example. Well, the interesting thing, of course, is you read through the, the rest of your New Testament and you discover in the Gospels that this Jesus actually is the creator. So read John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word. All things were made by him. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The Word was God. So here is Jesus who, as God, humbled himself, became a person uh, and, and actually is the creator in the flesh. So it's no surprise that he quotes as really an observer of Genesis because he was there, yeah. right? And he quotes it authoritatively. And so therefore what you'll find is he took a firm stand historically on Genesis as real history. Yeah, and Colossians 1, again, uh, backs that up, what you've just said, that Jesus is the creator. Well, but the apostle Paul has gone from one extreme to the other. You may remember, because he, he's the author of Colossians, and he got converted not by wanting to go to a Christian revival meeting. He wasn't influenced by an evangelist. He set out that morning to kill Christians, right? And yet God meets him and, and knocks him literally to the ground and knocks sense into him. And then all of a sudden the scales fall off Paul's eyes and he says, oh no, this really is the God of Genesis, the one I've been opposing. How blind can you get? And then he starts again, you know, for God who commanded the light to shine has shone in our hearts the light of the glory through, of God through the face of Jesus Christ. And so that quote from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 is a direct statement out of Genesis. God made the light to shine on day one. Jesus rose from the dead on day one. And away he goes and ties it all together. And the same in Colossians. All things were made by him who is the head of the church. And he wasn't referring to the Pope. He was referring to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, sadly, today, it seems that we're, we're, the, the, the politicians would elect our Archbishop of Canterbury, for example, uh, rather than him being appointed, really, by uh, the laity or, or, or voted well, in. In. In, the, in the church in England, of course, that's the historic position because the Anglican Church, unlike many others, is a political body and has been right from the start. So that if you go back traditionally through the UK and you'll notice how even when missionaries came into the UK in the beginning, the leader of the tribe, 
was who they were after because whatever religion he had, everybody else had to have. And so when you get dear old Henry having a problem with Rome over divorce, then he sets up his own church. But of course, he's a secular leader, and so his ministers must ultimately have authority over the church that he wants to run. So it shouldn't be surprising. We've still got problems with women in the Anglican church. That's how it was set up. And we'll be told you if you've got a nice house that's, like Hampton Court, that's you will true. lose it that's true. Uh, to the king. Right. Um, emails live at revelationtv.com. Obviously, you've got the information on your screen and you will be from time to time seeing John Mackay's contact details, which are uh, creation uh, uh, research. Dot net. Dot net and also ask John Mackay. Com. And Mackay is spelled M-A-C-K-A-Y. Yes, my father was a Scotsman and I've just come down from Scotland visiting some relatives and digging up rocks and fossils. Well, if you want to pose a question to John, please do that right now. Um, it's uh, live at revelationtv.com, as I said. And uh, do keep to the topic. And the topic really is all about uh, origins, if you like, and also the fossil record and things that perhaps uh, you don't quite understand. And, and I don't either understand everything, but we don't have to. But when we've got somebody like John in the house, as it were, tonight, then please do put those questions. Other things uh, leave aside, perhaps that are more theological based, uh, you know, academia uh, for those theologians out there. But John has spent uh, how many years now? I've been doing this full time for nearly 30 years. So, you know, I have a vast fossil collection, a wife who's very patient about where to put the next dinosaur. And, uh, you know, as I said, just coming down from Scotland where we found the squids and the trees fossilized together. And we're sort of trying to do our best to teach the next generation of young people as well as geologists, you can recognize a flood deposit because the prejudice in geology is you can have any explanation you like except two. It hasn't got to include God and it's got to leave out Noah's flood. Right? And so that's, that's the prejudice that's actually out there. So all of our scientific explanations are designed to eliminate God without even discussion. Well, you're in the right country in the UK for being squids in, mate, because that's a, a slang <laughs> term for quids. Um, but what's the significance of the squids being in the, found in the trees? Well, I was up visiting my family uh, last year and it was bitterly cold and uh, I was travelling down from Tongue, where my family live, and past a very old gold field and came across a reference to a sheep's jaw that had gold in the teeth. So I went and actually saw it and I passed it on to one of our young geologists. And of course, this meant that the sheep's jaw, which was fairly, it was just in the surface of the ground, the gold had actually precipitated on that relatively recently. It wasn't millions of years ago at all. And then as I went down past Helmstead and along the coast there, met one of the, the local collectors who showed me some of their collection of fossil trees and uh, mentioned some of the shells that had been found there. So I actually, went and did my homework, found the site, and decided this year to go back and see if I could find them mixed together. Not just in separate collections, but actually mixed together in the rocks. And praise the Lord, it was miserable weather, but the rocks were, <laughs> the rocks were really great. And uh, on the, the first slab just about, when I split it open, here is a beautifully preserved tree with coal on the outside and a fossilised squid backbone. They're called belemnites, if you want the technical term. But folks can go to creationresearch.net, scroll down the centre column, click on the Scotland picture, and it will take them to a slideshow, which is better than you know me just describing it now. But the whole significance of it, squids are marine creatures, trees don't live underwater, so therefore you've had water on the land washing the trees down and mixing them with the squids, but the squids are also lined up with the trees. So the squids didn't live there either. They've been pushed in and then the current has been pushing them along. And this sort of basically finishes the research I've done right from uh, down near Lyme Regis, all the way across the country to Robin Hood Bay and up into Scotland where you find the same rocks. And in every one of them we show you on creationresearch.net and down you get down to uh, say um, salt, be, um, salt burn by sea and you actually see a gigantic horsetail rush I found with a pectin shell. You know the sign on the Shell service station? It's just jammed, stuffed into this gigantic horsetail rush. And then you see over near um, Lyme Regis, huge big marine shells like the, 
present day Nautilus is about the only living variety of them and they're stuffed with huge trees going in all directions so you've got a flood deposit but what we've been trying to prove is hey listen it's not just a little dose of water way up in Scotland you can prove the same dose of water is down in near Whitby and right across down to Lyme Regis and in reality you can follow this Jurassic deposit all the way back to Remember last year we had the massive floods in Australia mm -hmm. and they covered our Jurassic yes. Ark deposit? Yes. Where we've got the same sort mm -hmm. of flood deposit. So part of the thing we've been doing is showing people you actually can start out and say, if I'm looking for evidence of floods and then bigger floods and bigger floods, you actually can do it. You don't have to rule it out because you say, well, if it mentions God, it must be religious. The real issue is not religion versus science, Howard. The real issue is, is it true that there was a worldwide flood or is it false? Is it true that Richard Dawkins is an over-evolved piece of hydrogen or is it false, right? Those are the only issues you should be concerned with. Right, so uh, questions on that? Maybe you want to challenge John tonight. I'm looking for emails, there's a lot come in. I'm just looking for something that's actually relevant for tonight, uh, please. Uh, keep them on topic. Dear John, it's wonderful you are back on Bible study. It's another John. That's the Bible study before. We're having a few problems with our emails tonight. Hopefully we'll, uh, we can keep these coming uh, directly to live at. I've also got my Blackberry on hand. Let me just make sure that we're still connected to you. Uh, it's amazing how many problems we've had today, John, but nevertheless, my goodness, Alex has sent loads in. Alex, I'm not quite sure whether you're a believer or just someone who's trying to um, hedge your bets. Uh, anyway, let me read one or two from, from Alex. Uh, Hi John, how old are the oldest trees in the world today? Let me just stop there uh, before I go on. Okay, you'll find the oldest trees today, um, what is it, four or 5,000 years, I believe is the oldest figure they've put on them. And then there's no more living trees apart from that. Um, they like to use some of the bristlecone pines to link all of these together. But what they, what they usually you mean when they say age is we've got one tree ring per year. Now that's the normal hidden assumption. Now over the years I've been forced to investigate this because coming from Australia, one of the things we've discovered is we have tree rings for a slightly different reason than you have them over here in the Northern Hemisphere. In Australia, we have wet season and dry season rather than um, cold season and warm season. So yours grow in the warm and slow in the cold. Ours grow in the wet season and slow in the dry. But what we've discovered, particularly in places of extremes, is you can have two or three wet seasons a year, you get two or three rings. Right? And the same is true, the bristlecone pines grow in the most extreme of environments. So what I would suggest is most of those figures that they add up from those rings are going to prove to be from the most unreliable sources of trees that grow in real extremes. Um, to have a regular season, winter and summer, you then have to add the following factor. Howard, you know your Bible. The Bible says there's no rain up till Noah's day. Then right. it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. Mm -hmm. There's no winter. Winter doesn't start till after Noah's day. Right. So therefore you'll find that our normal assumption that, hey, there's seasons now, there's always been extremes of seasons, it's invalid. And then you'll find after Noah's flood, you not only get extremes of seasons from cold to hot, you get massive periods of drought. And in Australia, you don't get rain for 10 years, you don't get tree rings that reflect those 10 years at all. And so in reality, the assumption is, whatever it's like now, it's always been. And so uh, it's Alex, isn't it, who's written yes. in? Uh, I'd encourage you, think through the data and see if you're finding my assumption is the present is the key to the past. Because you and I have talked about this often, Howard, and that really comes from Charles Lyell, who, quote, unquote, his aim was to get rid of Moses out of science, and he's done a great job, sadly. Well, he, he got, Alex goes on to say, you know, how old are the oldest trees in the world today? As I've heard, counting the rings and other dating methods, there are some 10,000 year old uh, and also older, which would mean uh, older than the biblical 6,000 years that uh, we talk about often on the channel. Why does science claim there are no trees, say, 50,000 years old or older? 
Okay, perhaps I can throw something in that may be helpful here. Remember I've just discussed the, the assumption that people look at the world, assume that trees are now always behaving and the seasons are always behaving now as they always have. And your erratic climate after Noah's flood is going to blow that for a start. Secondly, you need to know that we've now discovered that our carbon-14 methods uh, are not as reliable as they have always assumed to be and they were the ones that have been used to date the tree rings and vice versa and there's a recent paper out in Nature and people can go and see it listed on our uh, creationresearch.net and go searching for carbon-14 in which they say it's time to recalibrate many of these carbon-14 dates and so he'll find that the trees probably will cease being 10,000 years old because the rings won't prove to mean what he's been told. He'd be right though if you had trees, living trees, that had 10,000 years worth, real years worth of rings, you could not read Genesis as literal history. But to throw in a second thought, in one of the programs we recorded here today in which we brought lots of fossils in, and I'm sure folks will see it sooner or later on this channel and other channels perhaps, we made a point about fossils, whether they're living fossils like some of the cone trees are, or whether they're dead fossils in the rocks. There's an interesting rule out there, and it involves two things. One is, quote unquote, and particularly it showed up in the Science Teachers Journal in 2003, November of that year. Science is any naturalistic explanation without reference to God. And you think, hey, there's an interesting ballpark. I can play in this ballpark, and it's irrelevant whether God made the world. I don't even have to think about it. Secondly, you'll find that if you want to know what a fossil is, visit the San Diego Museum, a brilliant museum. I'd encourage everybody to go there, but visit their fossil section and you'll see up on the wall fossils, other remains or traces of living creatures. Now, you're almost approaching that, aren't you, Harry? Yes, right. <laughs> fast. <laughs> right, but then the next bit rules you out. It says fossils, uh, the critical factor is age. Fossils have to be older than 10,000 years. And you say, why not 9,000? Why not 11,000? And in the end, the bottom line is totally arbitrary. Remember Lyell? Mm -hmm. He's the guy that gave us the method of dating, which gives us these tree rings and everything else. And Lyell said, my aim is to get rid of Moses. Moses, Genesis, Ten Commandments, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, etc. And you give it to any high school student and say, <coughs> excuse me, um, read from Genesis onwards and tell me how old you think or how long it's been since Adam was on the planet. And you won't get a single student who says, wow, it reads like it was 100,000 years ago. The average person says, it doesn't seem any more than six or 7,000 years. Now there's the hidden rule. You have to have something that excludes Genesis being real. So the definition is A, it must leave God out or any godly information, and B, the fossils themselves have to be totally outside of history. Would you say that that's all the, the people like Richard Dawkins, etc., that are, are just trying to disprove that God exists by aiming a lot higher with uh, regard to the age of things? You mean that God doesn't exist? Yeah, that God yes. doesn't exist. In other words, it's not the evidence that matters, it's the attitude. Right. right so when they start, like I had a young PhD, he just finished his PhD, uh, and he was telling me, Genesis is illogical. And when I'd finished with him, he admitted he'd never even read it. And I said, what you mean is Genesis is unacceptable? And he finally backed down and conceded that. And the same is true. Richard Dawkins, however, has read it. But what he's doing is his best to actually get rid of the God of Genesis. And he knows that his best possible excuse is Charles Darwin. But Charles Darwin was the first disciple of Charles Lyell. And Charles Lyell set out to get rid of Moses and Darwin needed an excuse to stop you know, him being convicted about God because you may remember I've shared before on this program several years ago, you can actually visit his daughter's grave in the UK, his favourite daughter Annie and his great-great-grandson Randall Keynes actually said, you know, when Darwin's favourite daughter Annie died, he turned his back on Christianity and felt free and unfettered to pursue his theory of evolution. In other words, I don't want God, I've got to get it out, Lyell, Andy Moses, and Dawkins walks in and says, that's it. Mm. Okay, so given the fact that, or given the information that we have, and the attitude, as you call it, of these such people as Dawkins, 
do we need to be really that concerned? Because for me, Jesus Christ is much nearer to my generation than, say, Moses, and they could do their best at, or their worst at trying to make us believe that uh, the biblical accounts, say, for example, in Genesis, are fictitious or whatever. But you can't, as you started off this evening, uh, ignore what Jesus himself, who is a, it's easy to prove that he's a historical figure mm -hmm. um, than it is, say, Moses. And yet he, Jesus refers time and time again to the historical records in the Old Testament, including Genesis. So either Jesus is a liar, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which I certainly believe he's certainly not because of other things, uh, uh, or should we be really overly concerned about what they're saying and just say, well, let's point to a much nearer reference point in our history, more recent, like Jesus mm -hmm. Christ and the apostles. Surely that, that's easier to defend. Um, it may be uh, immediately easier to defend, but you end up with a serious issue, Howard. You know your Bible is in two portions. What are they called? Well, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay, why not the old history book and the new history book exactly. or the old story book yeah. and the new story book? Because yeah. there are stories in there, there are poems, there's history, there's law. Mm -hmm. And the reality is it's called a testament because the viewers out there will get one shot to write out a last will and testament. And it's a legal document. And it's a legal document where one party makes the rules and the people who are the beneficiaries have no choice but to accept them. So it's not a contract. It's a, it's a legal document, but if I'm going to leave somebody three million pounds, let's say I decide to leave it to my cat, provided I've crossed all my T's and dotted my I's and the lawyers are happy with it, then nobody will have any option but to make, let the cat have it. The interesting thing is a testament is a legal document, and if there's any error of fact, any error of history, or any error of law in it, the inheritance is null and void. Now, Howard, what's the inheritance that's given by the testator, the one who died, to pass on the benefit in the New Testament? What did Jesus die to give us? Well, he, he actually died himself in order to give us everlasting life. Right, I mean... so that's the inheritance. Mm -hmm. And it's the inheritance from Adam onwards, where God in Genesis 1, 2 and 3 actually says, I'm going to provide a saviour. Right, the, the, the offspring of this woman will crush the head of the serpent mm -hmm. and away you go and you follow through Abraham. So the inheritance is always the same, eternal life. But the devil knows, as do some of the smarter atheists, that if they want to get rid of both the inheritance and the authority of God to judge, then they have to establish that this document is illegal. Yeah. It has faults, it has errors of history, and it is, has errors of law. So that's why Genesis is attacked and the books of Buddha aren't. Mm -hmm. right? Interesting. Yeah, no, they're not. They're no, all they're the not. philosophers of ancient time. And there's more written about the New Testament, and especially the life of Christ, than any of the other yes, uh, famous uh, philosophers uh, of, our, of ancient times. Interesting. You know, that, I suppose what I find fascinating is that there is so much effort on behalf of the evolutionists and the atheists, the agnostics, to uh, put down the Bible and uh, the Christian faith or the Judaic faith come to that um, then then we would want to try and spend the time actually trying to come against those who have such a, an ideology well in reality they don't have anything to offer like I have a friend if you want to call him that from my old school days as an atheist and every now and then he'll contact me and says why don't you abandon all this and become an atheist and my constant challenge is okay what are you offering Right? Because I've already got Jesus, I've got eternal life, I've got a new body coming, and any viewer who watches me repeated on this program knows that I'm starting to really need one. You know, I had no voice last Friday, and I'm praising the Lord it's coming back again. But in reality, the inheritance you get from this Jesus, and you get nothing from an atheist view. So they've got nothing to offer. So there's the first point. The second point is when you actually begin to see them proving the Bible to be true. Like Richard Dawkins was in Australia early this year. I had um, a, a debate at the Monash University shortly after him and one of the university students actually came to me and said, listen, the newspaper, university newspaper, wants me to interview you about creation, about Christianity. And I said, fine. So we spent several hours together and you can see him getting more and more frustrated. And finally he said, listen, every time I ask you about faith, you respond with evidence. 
What's evidence got to do with faith? Well, you see, if you're an atheist, you believe nothing, based on nothing, for which you get nothing. That was Dawkins' model of faith. That's what Dawkins assumes we Christians do. You know, we make up Jesus to make us feel fuzzy. We make up this eternal life. You know, it gives us a do-good feeling. We try to pretend there's a reward or a punishment system. And he says, you don't need any of that, right? So to him, faith is whatever you make up. Whereas the Bible says, test everything, prove everything, only keep the things that are true. And then the Apostle Paul really punches you between the eyes when he says, if it's not true, that Christ rose from the dead, then the Christians are more to be pitied than everybody exactly. else. So Christian yeah. faith is a fact-based faith. And that young student, you could see him, he was just mind boggled. Every time I ask you about faith, you respond with evidence. And I had to remind him, that's how the Bible works. The Apostle Luke said, I've gone to all the trouble to gather the eyewitness accounts so that you might True. know. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And as John says, I've written these things so that you might know you have eternal life. And that's why, you know, the atheists can oppose me as much as they like. But at the end of the day, it's Jesus who is shining through me and giving me this eternal life that all you want to do is help them with it. You know, so that, that's the difference. Well, uh, trouble with the uh, trouble at Mill tonight uh, with the emails, but uh, they're coming through to my BlackBerry now. Uh, at least I can deal with them here. Hi, John. Could you please give me some specific examples of fossils of sea creatures found on high mountains? Uh, Larry from Salford. Now, I know you already gave the one with the squid, uh, but is there, are there other... Uh, well, the one with the squid in... was actually found down at sea level, so was it? Okay. <laughs> not up on tops of mountains, but you will find, like in my collection, one of my uh, colleagues was in Nepal, Right, and as you trek up the mountains in Nepal, there are heaps of uh, layers of fossils, particularly some of those nice, beautiful ammonites. And so in my collection, I have fossil seashells from high up in the mountains. Uh, I have in my collection some beautiful fossil squids from Lebanon. And if you go to our website, you can see us do an experiment to actually open up the fossilized insect, in ink sac and take the ink out and write with it. So number one, it was buried real quickly. Number two, it's found on a mountaintop, and we've known about this mountaintop because the Bishop Eusebius, look him up on Google and see where he lived, he actually visited the site and said, you know, basically me thinks I've seen the evidence of the great flood. Brilliant. Right? And so what you'll mm -hmm. find is that these creatures are bound all around the planet, even Mount Everest, and I've never climbed it, and I've no intention of it, how, but the reality is whether it's sea level or it up in the mountaintops, there's plenty of evidence that most rocks have been formed underwater and some of them since the flood have been pushed up. But then that's what the Bible says. At the end of the flood, God raised up the mountains, sank down the valleys, and anything that had been under the water is now way up there. Uh, Michael writes in, he says, Hi John Howard, good to see you back on the live programs. I wondered if John could identify, according to his understanding, the most notable meteor or asteroid strike upon the Earth in times past, the approximate dating of its created location and effects on early life. Do you have uh, such data? Well, the most visible one, if you just want to visit something you could call is user-friendly, tourist understandable, the one in Arizona is the most obvious one. Uh, as a, you know, here is where something hit the ground. I've been there, I've looked all around it, I've, you know, investigated rocks for, a, for vast distances around it. And uh, then you've got the more theoretical ones like the one in the Yucatan Peninsula, and you've got a few big craters up in Canada and some in Australia that most of the, they're totally out of reach of the ordinary person. They go to Google and go searching for them. You can see, well, the average person has trouble seeing them because they've eroded down and, and you know, they, they actually are difficult to discern unless you can read rocks like a trained geologist can do. But uh, what effect would they have had? Well, one of the most interesting stories that I ever had to investigate was the story that said a huge meteorite impact 65 million years ago, that was the date put on it then, caused a massive explosion, massive dust clouds, uh, freezing of the atmosphere or solar cooling anyway, and this resulted in the death of the great dinosaurs, the cold-blooded reptiles. Sounds now, like the Natural History was, Museum. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because my professor at university in Queensland had said, John, I want you to investigate all the theories of dinosaurs, I discovered one thing. 
That's a very, very popular theory. It's usually tied in with that KT boundary all around the planet, and I've got specimens of that. I've seen it in New Zealand. I've seen it not far from our dinosaur dig in Montana. And the date now has sort of shifted a bit, but regardless of that, what you'll find is that the general consensus that people say, this killed off the dinosaurs, actually doesn't work. Because if they died out because it got cold and you have cold-blooded creatures, then what are we still doing left with giant Komodo dragons? Right? They're giant, cold-blooded reptiles. We used to have huge, you know, goanna-sized creatures in Australia, and they were cold-blooded too. So in reality, it simply doesn't work, even though it's popular. So something else killed off the dinosaurs. But you know what didn't kill them off? The funniest theory I ever came across, Howard, was this guy who suggested that dinosaurs were evolving towards the end of their career at the same time as tobacco evolved. Okay. And they got hooked on the leaves and died of throat cancer. <laughs> that was the funniest <clears throat> one I found. I think it must have been hashes. <laughs> Uh, might account for what the people why they came to that conclusion anyway hi john my question is do alien beings exist on other planets and if that uh if they do they need christ and i, I cannot find any reference to them in the bible for example john chapter 3 says for god so loved the world not worlds um uh, is uh, from ken in london um so aliens on other planets just very quickly because we've got loads of emails yep. no that's through. fine uh very quickly then you may remember last week, Howard, about the report on Mercury, uh, that they'd found water, and NASA is spending millions of the public purse trying to find water on other planets based on the erroneous assumption that there's life on Earth, water on Earth, therefore wherever you find water, life is possible. And the biblical statement, as our writer quite re correctly refers to, is life will really only be where God put it. And there is no biblical evidence of life anywhere else on this planet. And there's no scientific evidence either. This is an interesting email because many people would have relate to this. And, uh, and certainly myself. But he says, it's really, um, let me put it in his words, that's easier. Hi, John How good to see you both on Red TV. My question is, what about the layman that can't understand science? Uh, people have called me pig ignorant, but I tend to find science hard to understand. Does that mean I don't qualify as having a position of creationism? I feel like I don't qualify to have an opinion on evolution. Uh, this is from Mike, as I say. Okay, uh, Mike out there. The answer is what you'll find, uh, I'd recommend you go to our askjohnmackay.com website because there's lots of questions there in which we try to condense the answers for somebody who doesn't have any scientific background. And so that's askjohnmackay.com. Uh, it's a website we've set up since I was last live on this program, which is three years ago. We, it's amazing how time flies. So go and have a look at that program there. And what you'll find is the mere fact that you are not good at science does not qualify you to not be a creation believer. For the simple reason, when you read from Genesis through to Revelation, it's not a science book. And you are not expected to be a scientist in order to be able to read it. And, you know, as Tyndale said, he wanted a translation that even a ploughboy could read, and the ploughboy was not an academic. So you read your Bible, you have a choice. Faith in the Word of God who was there, who said, In six days I made the heavens and the earth, and you are qualified to make that choice. Alternatively, faith in the opinions of Dawkins and Darwin and Attenborough and the BBC, who weren't there. Right? And all of their highfalutin, ever-changing, evolving theories that even you're smart enough to see, hey, they've changed their mind yet again. The universe used to be 20 billion, then it was 10 billion, then it was 15, now it's 13.7. Who knows what it's going to be by the time you're an old man. So what you find is, no, you may not ever be someone who can explain the scientific theory, but you are in a position to understand where evolution goes wrong. I'll give it to you very simple. God who is there is the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, I made the world in just six days. And he tells you in six days he made the heavens and the earth, and the seventh day he rested. And there's no reason, no biblical reason, why that's anything other than ordinary days. Particularly when you know he came to this planet as Jesus, and he turned water into wine, just like that. He didn't need millions of years. The astronomers think time will help them. Jesus knows it doesn't. Uh, this is uh, from Marilyn in North Wales and says, uh, why do scientists who know how genetics work 
uh, believe in evolution. They know species can't interbreed, i.e. a mule is barren, etc. OK, remember the comment I made before, when you're dealing with people like, uh, you know, the atheists who are out there, you find it's not a question of evidence, it's a question of attitude. So in a recent discussion I had with a, a PhD graduate, he was talking about how reasonable it was to believe that chemicals could actually get together and form DNA. And so I simply asked him a simple question, does hydrogen possess the ability to make codes? You see, because in his theory, there's no eternal God, there's just eternal hydrogen. But we've got hydrogen, we can test its properties. Hydrogen cannot do codes. Codes ordered information. So you could use hydrogen to try and make a cryptic code out of it, but the hydrogen will never organise itself into any meaningful sentence, whether you're using binary code or tertiary code or English code or whatever. And in his theory, hydrogen has to turn into carbon, has to turn into nitrogen. That all has to get together in the end to organise itself into DNA. And as I put it very simply to him, every atom, every substance, every compound that you find in DNA is provably not a compound that can make codes. So what was his problem? Well, by the time we'd finished a two-hour conversation, his problem was attitude, not evidence. So when you're dealing with the rampant person who, who, who is dogmatic about you know, the, the evidence for evolution, stop them and say, are you sure this is the problem or is it your attitude? Some of you may remember when I debated Steve Jones on the BBC and it was, <laughs> I thought it was fun because he's going on all about evolution and I said, stop Steve, why don't you tell people now you're an atheist and you're just defending your religion? Now that's the real problem out there, always go looking for it, don't feel you have to be overwhelming with mm. evidence for this and evidence for that, make sure you get to the real issue was, uh, is their heart actually open to receiving the evidence God has given in his word and in his works. I think that's the bottom line, isn't it, it? Is. Isn't when it comes down to it. Um, because there are very clever people out there that will argue and perhaps look as if they're winning the point and it's really as I was saying earlier, it's really just relating to what Christ has done mm -hmm. and, what, and how it affects and changes people's lives. To become yep. a Christian, a real Christian, uh, in that sense, is, is, is amazing. And you can see people that have come from uh, terrible backgrounds, people that have got, found themselves in prison for one reason or another. Well, I'll give you an example. I met a, a man at one of our meetings and he came up and he said, oh, one of your board members led me to Christ because we run Creation Research Trust in the UK. And I said, oh, where were you when this happened? He said, oh, I was in prison. I said, what for? He said, I was a murderer. Gosh. Right? And so he, you see, a totally changed man, now been let out because the reality is, you know, he's a different person. He's now someone who wants to give life. And just the last uh, couple of weeks, you know, we had a, a testimony from a young man who said, I could never control my homosexual tendencies. And then I heard you preach about God's power and Jesus has changed me. And he'd come for counselling to a pastor. He was having a feeling about girls. and He wanted to know if this was natural. Bless his heart. But you see, God had changed him. Mm. This is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. John asks a question to you, John. Uh, when did the Hebrew scriptures become known as the Old Testament? The testator argument only works if this was uh, what the Lord originally intended to call it, says John. Okay, you will find that what you are seeing in the whole of history, and this is why I encourage people to read through from Genesis to Revelation, and I'll be honest, I'm glad that in one sense I wasn't raised in the church because when you actually get challenged by God's Holy Spirit to find out what his word says and you don't go to church, you actually start at page one. And what you do is you see God working out his plan for his people. Now, initially you'll see him working through the Jews. So your New Testament actually says he came first to his people, but his own people received him not. Now, if you have grandma and she's leaving you three million pounds and you all of a sudden tell grandma to get lost. You tell grandma you want nothing further to do with her. You should not be surprised if grandma changes her will. And in reality, when you are looking through the testator argument, he did come to his own. He did offer them everything. He was willing to give them it all. And in reality, most of them rejected him. 
So in other words, he shifted them out of the kingdom and he grafted some of the rest of us into it are the words that are used. So hence you will find if you read the book of Hebrews, which is written to Jewish believers who'd become Christians, you find this concept of the Old Testament now embodied in the New Testament and those are the words that are used. So yes, the argument does continue. We have it in our own law courts. Grandma can change the will to include the rest of the family if the person she really wanted to bless says get lost. Mm. In fact, the, the terminology for calling the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, really would have come about possibly first, second, third century onwards, but it, it, wasn't, it isn't right to call it an Old Testament because the word of God is complete. All scripture is inspired of God, it says. It's, it's all scripture, but what you find is the terminology itself. Yes, mm. the New Testament is the words that are used in the New Testament, right? It's not a mm. label we invented. And so if you're going to call this the New Testament where God says, okay, I've come to my people, they've rejected me. Now go into the highways and byways, take the good news to the pagans, to the Gentiles, and I'm one of them. And I'm really glad to be adopted into the family and I know what my inheritance is and I'm praying for the Jews to come back in. Amen. Hi, uh, Howard and John. What would be, in John's opinion, the best proof of creation to answer critics? And that's from Kim. Okay, Kim. The best thing you need to learn to do is not to think there's a single proof. And I've given this advice before and it's something that most of us need to master. Remember when Jesus was debating with people? He actually debated where they were at, not where he was at. So when the Pharisees came and said, should we pay taxes? Well, the issue is finance, the issue is accounting. And so he said, give me a coin. Now, from then on, because the evidence was out of their pocket, he had them hung, drawn and quartered, no matter where the argument went. So what he did was he took where they were at and no matter what hypocrisy they were intending, they were willing to spend Caesar's money and they were carrying it around and pretending to be these God-fearing people when they really weren't. So he set out to expose their attitude, not the logic that would come as well. Likewise, when he's talking to the woman at the well, now he didn't say, okay, open up your Bible at Leviticus 17 and let's have a discussion on the origin of Samaria. He didn't do that at all. She wasn't there. She wouldn't have understood it. So she offered him water and he said, I can give you water that won't ever run out. I can give you water that will never let you be thirsty again. So what you need to develop, Kim, is a issue of discernment. So when I'm debating with people, my first issue is, Lord, give me wisdom to know where this person is at and then give me the argument that I need for their sake. So I've sometimes a little bit frustrated churches when I have topic one and I'll go in there and the Holy Spirit leads me to actually mention something else uh, and it's not in the program. But the Holy Spirit actually knows who's going to be in that church. And my classic example that I'll give you, and, and you don't mind if I take a minute or so to share this out because it's really crucial. I was in, in a church in one country and I'd been scheduled to speak on Matthew chapter 19, the issue we had there. And yet when I asked God what to talk about, he mentioned the Trinity. You're quite right. People don't normally go around hearing verses, but here's me, super sanctilia, saying, Lord, I'm here, I'm your servant. What should I talk about? The only word that came into my mind was Trinity. And I had an argument with God saying, I do creation. I don't do Trinity. And I prepared fully to actually speak on the issue of Matthew 19, marriage, the origin of the family, etc. And yet when I opened my Bible and began to preach from Genesis, where it says, haven't you read back in the beginning, God created the male and female? Then all of a sudden we're back in the beginning. And in the beginning, God created. God, Elohim, Elohim is a plural word. And God said, let us make man in our image. That's the verse Jesus quoted. God said, let us make man. And all of a sudden, I heard the best sermon on the Trinity that I hadn't ever prepared in my life. And afterwards, the pastor came and said, why did you preach that? That was wonderful. It was just what we needed. And I said, tell me, why did you need it? And he said, we had a young lady here today, and this is the first time she's been in church. I met her in hospital today. She said she'd come along because I was visiting her sick mother, but she couldn't believe this Christianity stuff because she couldn't believe the Trinity. Now, the pastor shared with me the following week, he led her through the gospel to Christ. 
So what you need to do, Kim, is whenever you get into a conversation, say, Jesus, I need to know what this person needs. I don't need to know all the proofs because I never have got the time to learn them. Mm. Talking of that, uh, there's a question that came in um, uh, earlier and left it until now. That is, uh, from memory, because I haven't got it in front of me, uh, that when a person gets to heaven and they see, uh, who do, or who do they see? Jesus uh, as a separate being to God the Father or just the one? Okay, well, it's a question you'll be able to answer face to face one day, Howard, but <laughs> you won't be on this program when yes. you do it. And everybody else will be able to answer yeah. it too because even Richard Dawkins and David Attenborough, rampant atheists though they may be, will be on their knees admitting that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, when you have a think about it, there are a few appearances of what are often called the theophany in the Old Testament. Remember when Abraham and Sarah were visited by three beings mm -hmm. and uh, Sarah laughed and that's in related to the name that she got. And so what you will find is that the three beings who appeared were visibly separate. Even though they were, they were addressed as Lord, they were one, mm -hmm. right? So they, they likewise you will find when the elders of Israel had a massive party. They had a being there who was above them, who was the Lord. And yet this was the Lord who spoke to them, who was singularly distinct from the Lord who spoke to Moses, who said, you can't even see me. The elders of Israel could see this one. So obviously there are distinguishing features that we could even distinguish on earth. So when we get to heaven, I'm pretty sure you'll be able to tell which one Jesus is. He's the one with the nail prints in his hands. Right? So it will be fairly easy to, yeah. to pick because he went in a glorified body, but you know very well he showed Thomas his hands. Just a, a scripture that comes to mind there um, is obviously speaking about now that he's at the right hand of the Father waiting for his enemies to be put before him. And, uh, I'm sure he'll get up off the throne and walk around too. Right, exactly. Anyway, did the land masses shift after the flood, asked Paul. Well, wasn't the, the fountains of the deep that erupted as well, uh, apart from just having this rain? So there would have been a lot of la land shifting taking okay, place. Okay, Paul, if you um, flick your Bible open to Genesis chapter 7 and have a look at verse 11, where it says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, it talks then about the heavens breaking open and the fountains of the deep cracking. Okay, and you find then it says the water, the, you know, the earth it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and then the waters rose up. And so what you will find, there's two sources of water in Noah's flood. One is the rain, and the other is the water that's obviously coming up from underneath. And if you're wondering where that came from, you need to go back to Genesis 1 and have a look at verse 9 where it talks about God gathered all the water into one place. What water? Well, you need to go back to verses 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 where it says, And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. And on verse 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, the first earth is covered with water. On the third day, the dry land is lifted up and the water is put into one place. At that point, you have one mass of water and one mass of land. Then in Noah's day, the water that's gone under the earth on the third day, now the whole place splits and it rises up again. And it's a well-kept secret amongst geologists that the first people to record a belief that the earth must have split. You can read it if you read German or even modified German uh, because Alexander von Humboldt wrote about it. In fact, if you like English, you can read it in Francis Bacon where he talked about the shape of the continents looks like it's been torn apart at Noah's flood. Or you can go to the 1850s and you can read it in Schneider's work where he talks about Noah's flood being the origin of the big cracks on the planet. And for all purposes, he's talking about what you and I would call continental drift, but not over millions of years. Unfortunately for him, Darwin and Lyell were on the ascendancy, so his continental drift, biblically based Noah's flood uh, belief system is shelved until the 1900s when Werner brings it out again, this time dressed up with millions of years and evolution and the theory has evolved several times since then. So now you have Gondwana and Pangaea and several splits etc and their belief is it's still going on as slowly as it ever did. Good answer. 
Hi, Howard and John. Uh, the leader of the church I attend does preach the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. However, it seems that she refuses to talk about in any uh, definite way the creation account from Genesis. She doesn't seem to think that the age of the earth is important. Uh, recently, she even suggested from the pulpit that the stars are still being made. Is this acceptable? Um, an acceptable stance from a Christian leader in two minutes. Okay, in two minutes, what you'll find is if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14, you'll find the reason she doesn't refer to Genesis as real history because Paul said, and if he was in your church, I do not allow a woman to preach in authority because Adam was made first. Okay, now you can sort that out with her at your leisure, but in reality you'll find that if she's preaching the good news of Jesus, she really can't make it sound good unless she preaches the bad news about how rotten sin is. And that's only rotten because God made the world very good and he has the right to judge and you find the whole gospel going from Genesis all the way through to Revelation is absolutely consistent and you can't just lop off the last little bit and call it the good news. There's some great Q&As on AskJohnMackay.com exactly about this issue. I'd encourage you to look at it. Yeah, I think I might be able to just squeeze this one on. Great to see you looking rested. Howard and John Mackay is looking wonderful. Please ask him to comment on the healing foods found in Genesis 1, and 30 that this lady, uh, Felicity Corbin Wheeler, has been on the program. She's written about it in her book as well. Healing uh, in the foods. Okay, you will find that the term healing didn't even need to be used in Genesis 1.29 for the simple reason everything was very good, there's no disease. And in fact, you will find that the plan that God had was to keep us alive forever, not just from the lettuces and the cabbages or whatever was in the garden, but from the presence of the tree of life, provided we didn't eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Once we abandon that garden and the ground is cursed, the sad news is, from then on, yes, some of those plants will do us better than others because our body is falling apart. But what you and I need is not to go back to Eden, but to forward to the new heavens, the new earth, where Howard, then he, the tree, leaves of the tree of the knowledge of, uh, uh, of the tree the of healing. life will be for the healing of the nations. That's and that's it. the real healing we yeah. need. So do read that, Ch uh, chapter 22, Revelation. We're at the end of this particular program. John McCann will be back tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow night and also for, on the second half of our mornings tomorrow. It is the 4th of December, just in case you need to get your chronological timing right in case you're watching this as a repeat. Thank you, John Mackay, and to you at home. God bless you. Bye-bye.